The year is 1840. The Reverend T.R. Robinson, who combines religion with science and is the director of the observatory at Armagh, is telling the distinguished members of the Royal Irish Academy about the strange things going on in Burr, County Offaly, or Parsonstown, as it was then called. It was known as Parsonstown because the family in Burr Castle were, and still are, Parsons, Earls of Ross, and Lord Oxmantown. All these names, but it simply means that the Earls of Ross were known as Lord Oxmantown before succeeding to the title. So that the Lord Oxmantown, the Reverend Gentleman was referring to, was in fact William Parsons, later to become the third Earl of Ross. I hope that cleared that up. Now, about the telescope. This is an ordinary kind of telescope. You might use it if you were a ship's captain on the lookout for pearls and that kind of thing. The kind of telescope the Earl of Ross was planning to build was a very different kettle of fish, however. This kind of telescope is known as a refracting instrument. That means that you see directly what you're looking at, if you follow me. Now, the instrument that was built at Burr and was to make possible important advances in astronomy was not a refracting, but a reflecting telescope. In other words, it made use of a mirror instead of a lens. That's putting it very simply. But it meant that the success of the instrument depended on how good the mirror was. And making big mirrors in the early years of the last century was no easy business. The London opticians themselves do not like to attempt a mirror even of nine inches in diameter and demand a price for it which shows the uncertainty and difficulty of its execution. In Ireland, we are more fortunate, for a member of our academy, Mr. Grubb, finds no difficulty in making them of admirable quality up to this size, or even 15 inches. But with all his distinguished mechanical talent, he is believed to be doubtful of the possibility of more than doubling this last magnitude. Our friend, the Earl of Ross, had no such doubts, however. He knew it could be done, and to a certain extent, how. Were there a limit to scientific discovery, and we had reached that limit, we should be in the condition of a man who, with the most splendid landscape before him, was insensible of its beauty, because the charm of novelty had passed away. Each successive discovery, as it brings us nearer to first principles, opens out to our view a new and more splendid prospect. Reverend Robinson nearly lost his clerical cool when he looked through Ross's telescope. It is scarcely possible to preserve the necessary sobriety of language in speaking of the moon's appearance with this instrument, which discovers a multitude of new objects at every point of its surface. Among these may be named a mountainous tract, every ridge of which is dotted with extremely minute craters. Nowadays, of course, we have maps of the moon every bit as good as those of Dublin City. But the Reverend Mr. Robinson, fitting into the eyepiece of Lord Ross's three-foot telescope, was glimpsing for the first time a strange, unknown world. The Earl had built the telescope himself with the help of carpenters, blacksmiths, and labourers on his Burr estate, none of whom, of course, had any special knowledge of astronomy. The crux of the matter was the making of the mirror, which had to be cast out of metal and carefully ground and polished. Here, the Earl demonstrated his flair for mechanical invention. 